So I offer my humble uh, obeisances to my former spiritual Vedanti spiritual master, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, and also to my beloved Sri Guru. Sri Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, humble obeisances to all the devotees assembled to Maharaj. Then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not saying any words, so he was wondering, are you, are you understanding anything I'm saying? <laughs> this is a difficult uh, subject matter because, like I said, it's uh, a very cryptic work, and sometimes you have to supply all the missing words. That's why someone said, you have three words in Sanskrit, then you have like three phrases of translation. How, how can it be? Because most of the words are not in the Sutra. But if you translate literally, it's even more difficult to understand. Like so far what we have seen, um, Shastra Yonitva, this is the third Sutra. Because Shastra is the womb, that's all it says. It doesn't say why is it so important that it is the womb or the source because it, it is meant to understand this Janmadi um, Janmadi uh, Jagat Brahma then so on and so forth. Anyway, there's two definitions that is being given of Brahma. The first one is just the most common for us to see and understand. We live in the world and um, then this question comes, where does the world come from? So scientists, they have the answer, they practically convinced everybody. Everybody thinks that yes, I know how the world came. It's, it's per chance. It's a big explosion, and then everything come into order. <coughs> big explosion somehow made everything come into order, which is the contrary of an explosion. But nevertheless, uh, everybody thinks that they understand because they accept the Brahman, um, which is also a part of the list of Brahman. Uh, if you change the word explosion to Omkara, then you have the complete picture, isn't it? That this is expanding, yes. Actually, this word Big Bang was not a scientific word. Yeah. It's actually a derision. You know that those who wanted to mock this theory, they were saying the world came out of like a Big Bang, but it's, it's, some scientists ex are explaining it. It comes more like an opening of the lotus flower, you know, like, like this is more like unfolding. Mm -hmm. Anyway, With logic, you cannot really understand everything, and people are, are trusting. People are responsible for giving knowledge. This is called apta, apta praman. Apta means a person of uh, uh, distinction, person trustworthy. So when we say Prabhupada said, this is like our authority, Prabhupada said. But he said also, it's not only like his authority, but he said something. Um, so it's almost shut down. Mm. But so scientists also they become like um, mm. 
trust, trustworthy people that people can trust. And most people, they don't question their authority. But the question is still asked, how can this beautiful world being at random, being created per chance, and uh, uh, there's so many questions unanswered. Is there life on other planets in this universe as an end, or is this open in, in space, and what is space, and what is beyond space? All this question comes up. You know, Prabhupada says, when we look at the sky on a clear night, on a clear, um, when, when, when you're away from the cities, because the cities, there's too much electrical light, so you don't see the natural sky. But if you see it in, in the countryside in the summer, you see all these billions of stars in the sky, then question comes to your mind. It's bound, it's bound to come. Like, you, it's just make you wonder. This is all this light, what are they? And what's happening around, even with the scientific explanation, let's just give a, even a, a very broader picture. There's so much, so many galaxies are there, meaning so many planets, possibility of life, what kind of life is there, intelligent life, and so on and so forth. So this is the first um, definition of Brahman creator of the universe and the maintainer and the destroyer. Everything is being created and maintained and destroyed because of this cosmic force, so you can call it God if you want, because this is how he is perceived in measure of theistic religion in Islam and Christianity in Judaism. You have a God that creates the world. He wanted this world the way it is and it is beautiful and everybody uh, living in it has been wanted by this God. So this is the first definition. But since it says you cannot understand this unless you study the scripture, unless you read and study the scripture, um, that is a, a more beautiful de definition given. That God, we've heard so many times, God is love, God is uh, goodness, the summum bonum, you know, this word that is being used by Shiva Prabhupada in the first canto, the absolute truth, the summum bonum. It's a Latin, two, two Latin words that comes from Aristotle, actually, and was taken by um, Christian theologian. And it means, summum means the summit of the uh, highest. Bonum means goodness, the highest good. What is the highest good? So, the, those that, oh, God is a spirit, we heard also this. But God is bliss, Ananda. This is really a new definition that encapsulated everything. The happiness we're looking for through goodness, through love, that is God. We, we, when, why is love so important? Why being good is so important? Because it brings us happiness. And this is the most important thing, that everybody is looking for happiness. So basically everybody is looking for God. And Srila Vyasadev, he actually uh, writes those sutra saying that Jiva can come all the way to Vigyan, or to this realization of the Satchit. But the Ananda Purusha, that is God, his happiness the Jiva's happiness can only come through connection with that Supreme Being. Otherwise, he cannot be happy. It's like the fish out of the water, this uh, metaphor that was given and even played in, in the early days. You know, you take out the fish out of the water, you may give anything that you think is desirable, a beer and money and, and cigarette and whatever you want, but wine and, and the house and the everything that you can dream of, he's going to die because he's not in the water. He needs to be in the water. That is his natural element. So similarly, if we don't, if not, we're not in the proper, uh, proper environment, then we may have all the money we, we want, all the uh, uh, possession that we desire, but we won't have happiness. And we see that sometimes famous people, very rich and famous people, then they commit suicide because they're still so frustrated. They have all the women they want, they have all the money, they have all the food and 
the drugs and whatever, you know, someone was talking about the different cars and someone has one for each day and uh, they're still very unhappy because this happiness is God. If you don't connect, then if you're separated, no matter what, you're not going to be happy. So this definition is really the greatest definition you can give about Brahma and it's too sad that Shankaracharya is not accepting it because he thinks that Jiva can be happy and you can have Brahma beyond Ananda. Yes, he's beyond Ananda because he's Paramananda. He's the supreme happiness, but you cannot make him unhappy or neutral. Like, it sounds like if you were, uh, like in Bhagavad Gita it describes also this, how you become uh, Stita Pragya, you know, you become totally uh, balanced, you're never too ex exhilarated by happiness or depressed by, by sorrow, disturbed by heat or by cold, so you're very neutral. But this is like the beginning stage, of course, because if you're uh, not testing some great Ananda, then this so-called equanimity will not last. And we have example of different Rishi, that because they didn't have this taste, like this Rishi who meditates under water, and because he doesn't appreciate Surabi, he doesn't appreciate the devotees that just seeing two fish mating in front of him, just giving him the desire, or maybe I should marry also. And then he comes out of the water and he has this mystic power so he can make himself beautiful and expands into so many different ways. And he tried to taste this bliss that people think is bliss. But after a while he realized, but I've broken my vow, I was much better underwater. So he goes back. And all the wives also, the 50 women that he married, they also go with him. They, they want to follow him. I don't know if they finally go into the, under the water, but this is what they want. They want to follow him. Whatever. So, um, in the papers I gave you, you know that they are slides, really. So, Tridandi Maharaj says, I don't understand these papers. Of course, because they are slides. <laughs> See, like, I put that Brahman is unknowable. You cannot know Brahman completely. This is the impersonalist claim. You cannot know Brahman totally. He's the holy other. Brahman, but Brahman is a general idea. Bhagavan is more specific. This is what Sri Jiva Goswami is saying is Bhagavad Sandarbha. He, he doesn't have a Brahman Sandarbha, this Bhagavad Sandarbha. Because uh, he considers that Bhagavan includes the Brahman aspect and the Paramatma aspect. He's going to speak about Paramatma, but the Brahman is not sufficient. Better to speak about Bhagavan, that includes... The... So if you turn the page, normally you have now then the desire to know Brahman. Normally you have that, yes. This is the, set, the first sutra. Back to the first sutra. So, if we want to inquire about Brahma, then how? And, and, and Shastra is evidence. Shastra gives evidence about Brahma, and we want to inquire about this Brahma, then what do we see in Shastra? In Upanishads, let's play the role like Shankaracharya, Ramanuja Acharya, those um, great Acharya, let's say, that really uh, put the Vedanta into um, something very important in India still today. So, and also we can go through the main, those oldest or most important Upanishad that they claim, like Priyadaranaka Upanishad, Sandogya Upanishad, which most of you haven't read, I suppose, but Prabhupada is quoting a few of them, but not thoroughly. Um, what is interesting, um, first of all, if you read Upanishads, I should have brought the, my book from Upanishads. But I can use the Govinda Basha. Upanishad. 
Um, if you read the Upanishads, those Upanishads, if you read Isha Upanishad, because Prabhupada has given a commentary, and Banu Swami has also came out with a translation with Madhva commentary on Isha Upanishad, and Vedanta Deshika, who is a disciple of Ramanuja Acharya, and uh, uh, I forgot who else, but interesting. Yet you can you can also compare with Shiva Prabhupada and this uh, further uh, commentary, Madhva especially, is uh, valuable. So, um, the Priyadaranaka Upanishad is a very long Upanishad and difficult to understand because um, whenever there's a question about Brahma, then there are many answers. And it seems like it goes into a gradation, like we've seen yesterday. There's Anamaya, Pranamaya, uh, Manamaya, Vigyanamaya, Anandamaya, and it's always like in the progression. And so you have this example, for example, Balaki Gargya. This is I'm reading from here. He approached King Ajata Shatru. You know that the Yudhishthira was called Ajata Shatru? This is not Yudhishthira, but Ajata Shatru means that the enemy. Whose enemy wasn't born? Ajata. Anyway, this is a king, and this uh, Balaki Ganga, he's a Brahmin, very proud of his learning, and in endeavors 12 times in succession to define Brahman as the Purusha. In the sun, in the moon, in the lightning, ether, wind, fire, water. And the king every time defeats his answer. He's always saying, this is, you know, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was saying to Ramananda Roy, this is exterior, external. And he's always, and finally, Balaki Garga is out of argument, he doesn't know what to say anymore. And very surprising, he submitted to the king, he said, okay, you're going to instruct me. And this is not the only time in the Upanishad where Brahman asked Kshatriya, please instruct me about Brahman comes, there's also this Shrita Ketu and his father, uh, they come to the king also with woods in their hand and say, please teach us Brahman. And it seems like sometimes the king or the Kshatriya, they know better how to answer about Brahman than Brahman themselves. But what is incredible is the Brahmin were humble enough to accept that they didn't know. But you don't find that today. Even if people don't know, they still pretend they do. Even when they know that they're wrong, they still go on because, you know, the ego is there. I'm not going to, you know, look like a fool, like I say something stupid and I'm not going to admit it. And I'm not, I don't, I didn't. Sternly. Yes. You know. So here, um, the king, very uh, simply, he gives this example of a deep sleeper, someone, a man who's deeply sleeping. His vital breath is still maintaining him alive. Nothing else is, is awake. His consciousness, he cannot speak, he cannot see, he's not aware of anything, he cannot interact with anybody, but his breathing is keeping him alive and also uh, is sustaining his body. And uh, when he comes back to the awakening life, he feels like nothing has happened. He's perfectly, of course, sometimes he has to, you know, wash his face to feel fresh, but at the same time, he feels totally normal, like it's something that is normal. His condition can go from waking uh, life to the sleep, to the deep sleep without dream, and still something is maintaining, and that is prana. So he says this prana, is the symptom of Brahman. But of course, it doesn't mean prana is Brahman. Even though there is some proposal like this in the Shandakya Upanishad, for example, there's a gradation. Just to um, show you that th we in search for Brahman. Brahman is difficult to describe and difficult to find, and we're in search of Brahman. The sage Yagya Valkya, he's like the hero of the Brihadaranaka Upanishad. He's like the Brahmin of King Janaka, King of Videha. Um, 
because he appears at least three, four times in the Priya Dharanaka Upanishad, so often in the court of Janaka, and Janaka is very generous in always giving thousands of cows every time Yagevaka walks out. One time he's propo proposing, this king of Videha is proposing because he's very a saintly king, he wants to uh, understand what is Brahman, so he has all these different Brahmin in front of him and he's asking, whoever can instruct me about Brahman, I will give a thousand cows and they will all have golden leaf plated on their, you know, on their horns and also silver plated on their uh, roofs. And nobody there to claim them, but Yagyavarka tell one of his disciples, okay, you, you bring these cows to our ashram. So then the Brahmin became angry. Madhav Maharaj, I don't have any cows to offer to Madhav Maharaj. So Yagyavalkya, he take all those cows and then the, the, all the Brahmin, they became very furious towards him. Say, how this man, he's so proud, he's thinking that he knows better than him. So they do, they start questioning him. And one by one, they ask him different questions. Uh, so, one of them is saying, um, explain to us Brahman in plain words, not in cryptic words. Like someone told me also, like, try to be more uh, simple <laughs> that we understand. So, he keeps on asking the same question, actually. Yagyavalkya asks the same question or the king? No, no. The Brahmins, the Brahmins. The Brahmins are furious towards uh, Yagyavalkya for claiming that he knows something they don't. So they say, we're going to ask him questions. So then Ushasta Shakrayana began to question him. Yagyavalkya, he said, explain to me the Brahman that, that is plain and not cryptic the Self, the Atma, that is within all. So then Yagyavalkya, he gave a counter question and this Brahmin is becoming uh, a little bit upset. And he said, you know, oh, you're just playing with words because he speak about the breath inside the man that is what is within everything alive and he says uh, well that's a fine explanation in a sarcastic way and Brahmin is answering come on give me a real explanation of the Brahman that is plain and not critique of the self that is within all and Yagi Valkya he says um, you can't see the seer who does the seeing you see, but you don't see the seer, that is the one the seeing. You can't hear the hearer without the hearing. You can't think of the thinker without the thinking. And you can't perceive the perceiver without the perceiving. The self within all is this self of yours. All else beside this is grief. Again, whatever is not Ananda, of course it's not. Of course this Atma can also be the individual Atma. This doesn't necessarily mean the Brahman. But this Brahmin fell silent. Then there's a different, um, there's a woman actually, you know, too bad there's no more women because they will, they will be happy to hear this. That in some Vedic time, the woman could actually ask questions to a Brahmin in big assembly hall and she's actually challenging him. She's challenging Yagyavalkya, answer my question, otherwise, you know, you, uh, whatever, um, you say it is going to come to naught. And um, she, she's asking, what is the world woven on? What is the basis of the world? And Yagyavalka keeps on giving different answers. On the air, on the sun, on the moon, on the stars, on the gods, Indra, Brahma, Prajapati, Brahma, Brahman, finally. And uh, I'm not reading this because it's kind of very 
repetitious all the time. The same words come back, the same question, and, and goes on and go on. And But he's saying at one point um, to the lady, when he finally says, I'm Brahman, then she's asking, on what then are the worlds of Brahman woven back and forth? Are they, they sustained by what? At this point, Yagyavaka told her, don't ask too many questions, Gargi, or your head will shatter apart. You are asking too many questions about a deity, about a womb. One should not ask too many questions. So don't ask any too many questions. So she fell silent. Then another Brahmin starts speaking, and they, he gives a, a, a succession of proposal because he's asking questions, and Yagyavaka asks questions to him. And that's it. he doesn't always, he gives eight, eight attempts uh, to, try, to try to answer this question, what is um, the Brahman and the Purusha, you know, the, as the Sarvasya Atmana Parayanam, what is the uh, soul that is the shelter for everybody. And every time Yagyavalkya is saying, no, this is just outside, this is external and everything. And at one point, he's um, answering Yagyavalkya, this famous Neti Neti, you know. That the only thing he can say about Brahman is that he's not. Nahiti, Neti. You never heard this? The Neti Neti? No, you never heard this? That, you know, so he repeats that many times in the Upanishads. And uh, because the, uh, his opponent, the Brahman, cannot answer the question, then his head does shatter apart, explodes. I don't know how they do it, but some, it was kind of um, uh, if you challenge um, if you challenge uh, someone who knows Brahman and you don't have the right answer, then you're risking your own life. Uh, of course, when his head exploded, then Yagyavalka says, "Any other questions?" And nobody there asking anything. <laughs> but this woman, Gargi, she came back again. Gargi. Bachaknavi, she asked two more questions uh, to Yagyavalkya and he's answering that this imperishable Akshara, uh, <coughs> this is the, the Brahman. Anyway, I don't want to convert you to Mayavad, this is not my goal. I just want to show you that there are different ways of trying to answer a question. Another interesting uh, part in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad is also a discussion between Janaka and Yagyavalkya. And the question that the king is asking, what is the source of light? That one man sees what is the source of light. And um, actually it's light, or light? light. What is the source of light? So the first answer is the sun, of course, you know, the sun is the source of light. So the king says, yes, but when the sun set, then where, 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 how can we see? What is the source of light for a man to, to see? So then he says, when the sun set, then it is the moon. So then the king says, every time he gives him cows, huh? every answer is, okay, I'll give you cows. But every time Yagyabalkya is saying, no, no, I don't want cows now, because it is, my grandfather says, I will accept donation only after I have taught, I, I, I have given an instruction. My instruction is not finished, so we have to go further. So then, uh, when there is no sun and when there is no moon, what is the source of light? So Yagyavalka say fire. Who can say electricity today, and we have this power. But he says, when the fire dies out, or when there is you know, no electricity, where is the source of light? So then he said the voice, because when you're in the dark and you want to go somewhere, and someone is situated somewhere, he can guide you by his voice. He say, over here, over here. So then you can go being guided by the voice. Then the question is, and then if there is no sun, there is no moon, there is no fire, there is no voice, then where is the source of light? So the final answer is the Atma. The Atma is the source of life. And this, of course, we can ask the question, like it is always being asked, is this Atma the Jiva soul, or is it uh, the Brahma? And uh, 
Another example of this gradation is uh, six inadequate definition of Brahman, Pranove Brahma, Shrutave Brahma, Manove Brahma, and so on. And uh, it's always the same thing. It's a gradation. We have seen Anamaya. The first answer is like food is actually the Purusha, the real Purusha. The, what is made of food, the body is made of food, so it is real Purusha. Then, but, but the physical body is not the whole self, so Prana uh, is, Prana Maya Purusha is describing the real Purusha, and so on. So, different definitions are given like this, one by one. In a Shandogya Upanishad, Narada Muni approached Sanak Kumara, and Sana Kumara asked Narada Muni, what did you learn? Tell me what did you learn? And he said, I learned Rik and Sama and Yajur and Adarva Veda, I learned the Puranas, I learned the Mahabharata, I learned the astronomy, astrology, I learned mathematics, I learned the science of logic, this, the language of demigods, the language of human beings, all the language of human beings, the language of snakes, you know, the Naga, and so on and so forth. And then Sanat Kumara says, all that you have described is only words. The Rig Veda is only word, the Sama Veda is only word, and so on. So worship the word. Then he also proposed something else, higher and higher and higher all the time. It's not uh, after the words come uh, speech. Whatever you can speak is greater than words. Then the mind, the mind is greater, worship the mind. Then Sankalpa, Chitta, Dhyana, Vigyana, and the last is called Bhuma, the great absolute, unlimited, the supreme soul. So I'm just, this is not given as sutras, it's just to give different uh, idea of uh, gradual instruction about Brahma, that it is not, if you want to speak about the impersonal Brahma, then you do it in a gradual way because you cannot describe something which is beyond words. Even though, like Sri Ramadvacharya said, Brahman is not indescribable, it is not inexpressible, na ashadda. But here we're speaking on only about the impersonal Brahman. That is why Jiva Goswami was saying that Bhagavan is more specific than Brahma. Brahma, you can only say what is not and some quality or some comparison. So, I don't know any other words to use but symbols. This is, the next page is describing, actually there's uh, four symbols, I missed one. The first one is the Aditya, second is Akasha, then Prana, then Jyoti. Akasha means the sky. Well, first of all, the Aditya, it's not on your sheet. Um, the sun, Brahman is compared to this. Then we go back to the Sutra. This is after the um, Ananda Maya Adhikarana, the topic on, on, on happiness, on, on bliss. We come to a further definition of um, Brahma and the person within the sun. Antasta Dharma Padeshat. This is the, the Sutra, Sutra 20. And um, it's the sun. The, the Brahman is compared to the sun. It's a symbol, not th that the sun is Brahman, because the confusion can be there in many uh, religions, like in Egypt or uh, the Incas, for example, or others, they're worshipping the sun as the supreme god, because it's Surya in India gives the light, so light means the life and everything. So the sun god is the supreme god, but this is just using it as the source of light, and this is the person within this sun. And this is quoting from Shandogya Upanishad. Um, I'm not going to read the whole Sanskrit, just a few words, because there's a few words that are important. Atayo um, Ataya Sontar Adityo. Iranya Iran Maya Purusho Drishate Iranya Smashur 
Iranya Kesha, Apranaka Sarva Eva Subanastasya, Yata Kapiya Sam Pundarikam Evam Akshini. So it is described as a beautiful golden person within the sun. Iran Maya Purusha, who is described, um, he who is to be seen in the sun and is a golden person having a glowing mustache, glowing hair, glowing from the tip of his nails and having eyes like a blossoming red lotus. He is called Ut, he has risen above all sins, he who knows this rise above all sins. So interestingly, this is a passage that one day the first Guru of Sri Padra Ramanuja Acharya was reciting when he came to the word Yata Kapiyasam Pundarikam he says uh, that the um, eyes of this golden person is like Kapiyasam it is like the buttock of a monkey actually this was the uh, translation that Shankar Acharya gave and hearing this, Shibad Madhavacharya, uh, Ramanuja, he became very grief stricken and a hot tear came from his eye as he was behind his Guru Dev massaging his head. It fell down on his head, burning hot. And the Guru, he, he understood that something was, was disturbing his disciples. So I said, what is the problem? So he says, this is a very offensive way of describing the eyes of the Lord. Anyway, this, where is it written anywhere, this kind of comparison? He said the Kapiyasam is actually an apax, yeah. you know, in, in the grammar. This is a, a, a Greek word meaning uh, a word that is used only once. It doesn't occur that many times. It, it's, it's like an exception. It actually described uh, a lotus that blow uh, a red lotus that, that, that blow under the sun. So the, the description that it is given is, is that the, the eyes of the Lord are as beautiful as a red lotus opening under the sun, which is appropriate to the description of the person within the sun. And he's saying also that this description of uh, Kapiyasam Pundarikam, that is uh, often attributed to Vishnu. Vishnu has lotus eyes. And hearing this explanation, Yadava Prakash, the guru, the former guru of Sri Padra Ramanuja Sharya, he became very fearful and envious and he plotted to kill his disciple. He said, this person is going to create me problems. So he started, but this is the verse coming from Shandogya Upanishad, describing that the Lord has a specific form. That is an interesting aspect also. Um, Vishnu possesses a spiritual lustre body, not intoxicating beauty, like you said, because I like this description. Krishna has the intoxicating beauty, but beautiful nevertheless. And this is a commentary of Vedanta Deshika. He's in the line of Ramanuja Shalya. Uh, the description of the Purusha in terms of physical body with golden color, with eyes similar to the lotus and so on, gives room for the doubt that such a being could be Brahma, because how could uh, Brahma be embodied? How could it be a, a person? But she, Bhadarayan or Vyasadev, reject the view that it could be a, a celestial deity called uh, Surya. And in front of the Purusha seen in the sun and also in the eye is Brahma who possesses a spiritual lustrous body. He, then they talk about Paramatma because this is a very important notion in the Ramanuja Sharya uh, line, this Antaryami Brahmana, also coming from Priyadaranya Kaupanishad. That is the soul within everything. So the soul within the sun, this is what is called this Iranma, Iranmaya Purusha. Um, Vedanta Deshika points out that the body of golden color, Iranmaya, with eyes similar to the lotus, doesn't refer to the physical. Um, body caused by karma, but it is a spiritual divine body considered of Shuddha Sattva. It is a body assumed by the Supreme Deity out of his own will for the benefit of the devotee who desire to meditate on him. It is such a supreme person who is endowed with glory and associated inseparably with Goddess Lakshmi. 
This purusha in the orbit of the sun is none different from the purusha abiding in the inner recess of the heart. I wanted to read you this because you can see that um, this is Vaishnava philosophy. You heard all this Yagya Bhakya. Um, this is an impersonal thing, very dry. And the Vaishnava immediately they see Vishnu as the Supreme Brahman. And I included within this sheet uh, actually the other commentary on this sutra, Ramanuja commentary. 1120. Uh, this, this is what he says. It's quite beautiful. Bear my mind. Um, mispronunciation. If you don't have the sheep with you. The Supreme Brahman, different from all else, by his slope of infinite bliss and knowledge, devoid of all fault, as as his very nature, unlimited, astonishing, inconceivable, eternal, spotless qualities like youthfulness, charm, beauty, tenderness, fragrance, and brilliance, manifested according to his desire. Out of his mercy to the devotee, Narayan, the Supreme Person, the Supreme Brahman, free of material false and sin, and an ocean of unlimited compassion, affection, good character, and mercy, revealed the appropriate form to the devotee according to his surrender. It's beautiful. If you read If you read the uh, introduction of Sripad Ramanujacharya to Bhagavad Gita, his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, I have it here, but I won't read it to you. But it's four pages of praise. Maybe the first paragraph, just to give you an idea. The Supreme Lord Krishna, the Lord of Shri, whose essential nature is being the sole reservoir of all illustrious attributes, and who is the antithesis to all that is evil as exemplified by wisdom and bliss, who is the great ocean of the infinite, immeasurable, exalted and innumerable glorious qualities, which being part of his natural essence, such as omniscience, power, sovereignty, eternality, eternality, omnipotence and splendor, whose transcendental form is a treasure house of effulgence, beauty, loveliness, and perfection, beyond all conception, divine, wonderful, everlasting, and invincible, and sublime being immutable in accordance with his will. He is adorned with countless transcendental ornaments, variegated, bountiful, perfection, and worldly, worthy of him in every respect, and so on and so forth. If you understood what I read, it's, it's just laudatory praise of Vishnu, Krishna for four pages. This is how he introduced Bhagavad Gita commentary. And he's giving, I gave you this, this is his commentary on this verse, on this sutta. Uh, they're talking about the sun. The, uh, yeah, this is sun. Anta ta dharma podeshat. The Purusha will reside within the orbit of the sun and also in the eyes of Brahma. So he's uh, Vishnu, Surya Narayan. Then you have the natural elements, Akasha, Prana, and Jyoti. So you have the 22nd Sutra, still in the first chapter, first Pada, Akasha Talingat. Akasha, ether or space as a symbol of Brahma. So there's no doubt that you see the omnipresence of space everywhere. And Shankar is quoting uh, uh, a passage often saying, Akashavat Sarvagata Shanitya, omnipresent like space eternal. And Newton also was designating space as the sensorium of God, the, what is the, you know, the embodiment of God. And, Emmanuel Kant, he was saying, I, there's two things that I admire in this world, this starry sky above my head and the moral law inside my heart. So this universe also, this space, like I was saying, uh, when you look at space on a starry night, then you, uh, questions come. And space is unlimited. You can take also the horizon. If you look at the horizon on the sea, this is some indication of infinity. And space 
often God is situated in space or the sky because the sky has no limit. This is one thing I tell the children or the youth uh, to make them understand the idea of God. Where is space ending? And, be, and if there is such an ending to space, what is beyond? Because the mind can't even imagine. Even modern scientists with all their brain, they think that the cosmos has no limit. How can it be? That means the cosmos is God, if it has no limit. Because if they say it has a limit, then what is beyond this limit? There's a barrier somewhere that says you cannot go, you cannot go further. What is further? So they cannot even imagine that. So the, um, the, the creation is speaking about God. But Akasha, in that sense, it's not the Buddha Akasha, the material element, space, but Akasha, I call it the symbol. A symbol is a sign, a visible sign, to show something invisible. That is what a symbol is. I know that some devotees, if you say, speak about the symbols, they're going to say, you are making it cheap. But actually, no. The symbol means I'm putting a sign to show uh, a visible reality by the sign, and this is pointing out to something which is hidden, which is invisible. So Akasha is not Brahma, but but it can be some kind of a symbol to illustrate what Brahman is. And this Akasha is not sufficient. So the next proposal is Prana. We heard many times how Prana can be uh, an example of Brahma. Atta Eva Prana, this is next sutra, 23rd. Akasha means the, the unlimited sky. Yes. Yes. It's, it's a natural symbol people use for God or for um, infinity, you know, some philosopher was saying infinity is what it describes God, you know, the, 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 the infinity is within us also, or just the plane horizon. We know there's, there's earth behind this horizon, but we cannot see it, and this is an indication. And also we don't know where the um, water, what is separation between water and the sky. And uh, the sky also has a rounded horizon that looks round around us. Scientists are saying because the earth is round, we may say it differently, but we see that there's a common horizon like a big eye or something. So this is bringing to mind uh, an idea of mystery. Children, natural and natural philosopher, because they keep on wondering. Socrates was saying, a philosopher, someone who is uh, marveling, is admiring, is like surprised. How, how come this? How come that? This is what children always ask: Why this? Why that? They are always so full of questions, and 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 adults they cease to ask this question. They just want to ask if you know in the market, you know the price is going up or down, or if if they're going to have a good day, or if this is the material, you know, day-to-day -day worries. But the children, they just admire this world, and they think it's a wonderful world. But when you go back to this childish attitude, not attitude, but childish wonder, you can see that the world is full of wonder, and you are always coming back to the same question. What is all this? Why am I here? Why is this big world being created? For what reason? By whom? What is, what is, you know, in outer space? Is there a limit to the sky? Uh, is there a creator? All these basic questions, you cannot just keep on asking them without trying to find the truth. Or put a lid on this question. Most people, they still don't ask those questions. They're just going to make you crazy. Or they're gonna, you're going to become a Hare Krishna. <laughs> So don't ask those questions, but actually the goal of life is to answer those questions. That's why how Srila Prabhupada was saying, Atato Brahma Jigyasa means in this human form of life, try to inquire about the Absolute. Don't waste your time like the birds chirping on the tree. Where is food? Where is, where is my mate? Where is all these questions that are relative and would not lead you anywhere? But try to ask the highest. What is the highest? So this is an indication. You had all this gradation, 
and he was also uh, Vedanta is giving you some example as symbol, visible sign for an invisible uh, entity. So prana is the next proposal. Atta eva prana. This is the most intimate essence of things manifested in the activity of all the organs. Someone said also that prana means all the vital organs. But above all, with the process of breathing, this is what determines your life. The body of all organic being alive can be sustained only as long as the prana is in there, the, the life. All these creatures enter with the breath into the body and with the breath they again depart out. When you give up your last breath, that is, means death. And you have the fun example in the Upanishads of the superiority of prana uh, towards all the different other organs like the eyes, the ear, the speech, mana, the mind. Uh, you have a parable where all the organs are fighting with each other saying, I am most important. The ants are saying, I'm most important, I do all the work. And the stomach is saying, no, I ought to digest all the food. And then the eyes say, I do everything. So then they decide, okay, we're going to take leave of the body, one by one. So the eye side, they decide to go out of the body for one year. Then the body became blind, but still could function. So I came back and then whatever, well, the body was still working, but just blind. Then the ear, the, not the ear, the physical ear, but the earring left the body and then for one year and they came back, and then the senses asked him, they, I, he asked the senses what happened when I, while I was gone. Well, the body still functioned, we just couldn't hear anything. Then same thing for the taste, same thing for the mind. The mind left the body, the body was still functioning, but the person was dumb. So in this world you can see someone who has no hearing or no eyesight, sometimes even two senses missing or three. You can see someone with no eyesight, no hearing, no taste. Also we have no taste for rasa, that's a different thing, but no taste, no uh, mind. But then when the breath, prana, decided to leave the body, he didn't even leave the body, all the senses, no, no, don't go, because they felt everything was going to collapse. They felt, as soon as he was trying to go, they stopped him and said, no, no, you are the king, no one, no problem, come back, because everything depends on prana. This is given in several Upanishads. And you have also the uh, opposite parable of the organ returning separately to the body. The body is unconscious and one by one they come back. And only when prana comes into the body, the body becomes alive. You have the same story in Srimad Bhagavatam in the third canto because Srimad Bhagavatam is Shruti Saram. It is a cream of all Shruti. So it is describing the Purusha. How the Purusha, he's lying and, you know, without any any life symptoms, and all the senses with the gods enter the body, and nothing happens until the chitya, the consciousness enters, then it opens. So the chitya is also a synonymous for prana. It's also called pragya. Sometimes you call it pragyatma. You only add this uh, Spanish n, you know, to the uh, prana or this gya, and then it becomes pragya instead of prana. So, um, this importance of prana we've seen, anamaya, pranamaya, manomaya, vigyanamaya, anandamaya, is also like a symbol of Brahma. It, it is illustrate, illustrated in the Upanishad many places. Akasha, well, so the Aditya, the sun, Akasha, prana. Then another symbol is Jyoti. Jyoti means light. This is the next sutra. Jyoti. Charanabhi Danat. Um, is it Sutra 24? Yes. You have it? No, it's not. No, you don't have it. Jyotish is in a, a link with Gayatri. Um, in the Shandogya Upanishad, actually, someone observed that all these different proposal in the Vedanta Sutra, in the first Pada, follow the sequential of Chandogya Upanishad. It speaks about uh, Aditya, then Akasha, then 
prana than jyoti. So in the Shandogya Upanishad, third chapter, that light which shines above heaven, higher than everything, in the highest world beyond which there are no other world, is the same light with the, which is within men. So is it this uh, ordinary jyotish or it is the Bhagavan? Um, the Sutra, translation of the Sutra, light referred to Brahman because of the mention of Brahman's feet in the previous verse. So what is uh, those feet? Those feet are metrical. They refer to Gayatri. So Shri Bharadev Vidya Bhushana is quoting from the Purusha Sukta. Itava nasya mahimano jayamsya purusha parusya sarva bhutani tripadasyam vitam divi this is quoted also in Chandugya Upanishad. Like I said, um, scriptures, uh, they always expand. They quote other passages of the scripture and different meaning is being given. So, uh, Purusha Sukta appears in many Upanishads, including also Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto. Prabhupada called it Purusha Sukta confirmed. And you see the same practically the same verses. So this idea of Purusha uh, has a long history and uh, has become Vishnu, uh, not become, but has been identified clearly as Vishnu. Uh, so Gayatri is also a meditation on the sun. Uh, some, of course Gurudev didn't give that explanation, but Gurudev is Rasa Tattvik. He goes deep into the meaning. Um, next sutra is talking about this Gayatri. If one objects that the feet are in reference to the Gayatri meter mentioned previously in the same section of the Upanishad, the answer is no, so it's contradicting me, okay. Since that section teaches concentration of one's heart on Brahman in the form of Gayatri. Yes, this Gayatri actually is just a way of meditating on Brahman. Yes, it's just a precision. Shilabhadya Vidya Bhushana commentary. It is said, Gayatri, Vaidam, Sarvam, Bhutam, Yadidam, Kinchit, everything that exists is Gayatri. But this Gayatri is a way of meditating on Brahman. It's not the sun. Shilabhadya is not Brahman or either. It is Srimati Radhika. She's the body, just like this Janmati Asya Yataha. When I was speaking about Swarup Lakshana, Tatasha Lakshana, and how Shankaracharya said that Swarup Lakshana of uh, Brahman is not Janmadiya Sariyata, but Satyam Gyanam Anantam. According to Vishwanath Gravati Tako, it is Janmadiya Sariyata, but not in the meaning that uh, Brahman is the origin of everything, but in the sense of Adiras is the origin of everything, the first Ras. The loving affair between Radha and Krishna is the origin of everything, of spiritual and... So, what duty refers to? Light. Light, but light like, like you explained before? Yes. Like a sun, moon, fire, voice, atma? So it could be like this also, what is behind, because there's a... Um, in Upanishads, also in Srimad Bhavatam, it is out of fear that uh, the sun is shining out of fear of me that the moon is also shining so the light of light is Brahman and everything that comes as a natural light like fire uh, fire or moon and and sun electricity is just a dim reflection of that light of light so, yeah. but is there anything more than Jyoti after? yes Effulgence can be also used. Brahma Jyoti, you know, we say how Brahman is full of light or effulgent. Other radiance, yes, the aura of Krishna. But it's, 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 it's a metaphor used often to describe God or to describe the uh, uh, Supreme Being that He's full of light. Yes. Huh? So all this Aditya, Akash, Prana, Jyoti, you say it's like a symbol, but how, how the Vedanta see it? Like a symbol means something illusion or? No, it's not, like, it's not like, talking about symbol. 
Vedanta is not talking about symbols. So they, they really say that they really say that that prana is part. It is like a part of Brahman. It is no. what, what I don't understand. Because the Vedanta Sutra are very cryptic. It only say Atta Eva Prana. If you translate literally, therefore, this is Prana. That's it. Doesn't say the word Brahma doesn't appear anywhere except the first sutra. You have to supply all the words. Jyoti, Sharana, Bidanat. Because because it's in the uh, ablative form. So because or on account of having feet, it is Jyoti. That's all it says. So there's no um, indication directly of where the light comes from. In the sutra, no. You have to provide according to Shastra. That is because this Shastra, Yonitva, Tattu, Samanvaya, Madhvacharya, that doesn't dissociate the two. Shastra, Yonit, Sarva Shastra, Yonitva, with the Tattu, Samanvaya. Meaning, in, in English, you have to understand Brahman through scriptures and Read the scripture with samanvaya, that is um, so what concordance they... or uh, uh, comparison and uh, so what do they logical. Des... Huh? What do they describe as the source of the light? Who? Who? Okay. What? I don't want to read Shankaracharya. I already read you Shankaracharya. He doesn't disagree. They don't disagree on this, these topics. They disagree mainly on the topics we already talked and then further on. They don't disagree on this because the question of, you know, the way it is written, there is a subject matter. It's called Vishaya. We propose something and it's based on one Upanishad or many. And then there's a doubt, Samshaya. Like, Brahman is light, okay? Because it says uh, in Upanishad, Shandogya Upanishad, Atayai. Atalya atal paro divo jyoti or dirkyate vishvata pichteshu. So it said, talks about purushe jyoti, you know, within the, 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 the light within man is the same light that shines in the high, high heaven. So this is the proposal. Then the samshaya comes, doubt. This is just natural light. It doesn't come from Brahman. It's not Brahman. Then you have a purva paksha. Purva paksha is the first answer. Uh, which is always wrong. This is how it works in, the, in those debates. It is always wrong. The light, the natural light, is Brahma. Whatever you see as light, you can worship as Brahma. This is what some common people will do. They will see, they will worship trees, they will worship the sun, they will worship the moon, thinking that because it gives light, because it gives something. The other day we saw that the uh, full moon was really agitating the ocean. And so therefore it has an action on the element and, and on the mind. We say that the moon represents the mind. So then you can worship the moon. Some people do this because they think this is the absolute, but it's not what it says. This is Purva Paksha. So Siddhanta comes and Siddhanta will say no, because there's a reference to the Gayatri or to the Purusha Sukta, whatever. Um, see the Etavana Syamaima To Jayamsha Purusha has this verse from quoted in Shandogya Upanishad is translated in this way. Such is the greatness of Gayatri. Greater than this is the Lord. All entities are one of his feet. Because it said, Tripad Asyam Vitam Divi. There's four feet. There's one foot which is the material world and three feet which are hidden. You can also interpret it like this. Because the, the Sutra is only saying, Jyoti Shanat. On account of having four feet, therefore light. So, this is the difficulty in understanding the Sutra. You need a commentary, because otherwise you don't understand what the Sutra is saying. It's too short. It's too short. But, you know, to make this uh, more simple, I try to present it like I use the word symbols, not in the text. Because it is clearly a non-living thing, Akasha, Prana, Jyoti. Aditya, yes, there's, there's a deity of the sun, but Akasha Pranajuti is called just some, some 
element. So it is a comparison we can make, and it's been often done, that uh, Brahman is light, Brahman is uh, life. Even in the Bible, he breathed out in, in, inside man, and man become a living body. So the soul of man is made of the breath of God. I don't see why the animals cannot be also creatures of God, but they say that man has a special thing, this is the Christians, uh, that he's being breathed in the breath of God. So, um, you, you need this guide, guidance of the spiritual master. This is what Srila uh, Bhadar Vidyabhushana you were saying. Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Now that you have come in contact with the sadhu, with the guru, now is the time to inquire about Brahma. That is his translation. It goes a little step further because he says you cannot inquire on your own. How can you have this desire? You can have some curiosity. But when you come in contact with the sadhu, he creates all your question. He creates Srila Prabhupada, he was always saying, uh, I created your Sukriti. It's not like we can because, you know, some past Sukriti. He said, I created your Sukriti. Of course, you need some to stay with the spiritual master, but you can cultivate also by good association. That is the idea. And um, so the spiritual master, he can reveal everything in your heart. Yasya deve para bhakti aryata deve tata guru tasite karte yata prakashante mahatmana. This is the last verse of Shweta Shvatara Upanishad. Everything can be revealed in your heart, including Vedanta Sutra or Rasa Tattva. All this tattva, how can you think that they can be uh, understood by your own mind, by your own intelligence? If it is when the guru inspires you, so, whatever realization you may have comes from Gurudev, your Gurudev. You cannot take the credit, it is coming from your Gurudev. And also you have to apply studying, of course. You just can't expect to lay down and everything is going to come naturally. But whatever, whatever... That is um, also, that you also have received from your Gurudev, to study Yes, that also. Of course. of course, everything comes from your Guru. That's why there's no word that can express the gratitude. And we can have for our Guru. He cannot say just thank you. The best way to repay the Guru is to abide by his instruction and try to please him, to know his heart. What is pleasing? And what we do here and throughout the year, but you know, when we gather, we try to hear some harikata, we try to understand some philosophy, we have to understand that it is pleasing to us, of course, but it is mainly pleasing to Guru Dev, that this is what he wants. And to the Guru Parampara, no doubt, whatever the subject is, Bhagavad Gita, Rasa Tattva, Vedanta Sutra, all this, uh, they want us to be interested in. Not that we become big scholar and then you put some paper, university paper on the wall. That is a secondary, very, very insignificant thing. Uh, what is important is to be able to understand and follow and clear all the doubts. This anarta livriti. We clear all the doubts. You don't have all, you know, any more confusion. If your mind is fixed on siddhanta then you cannot be easily uh, deviated by uh, bogus philosophy. Of course, you need some rasa, also uh, tattva, because if you only uh, learn siddhanta, you have no rasa, you become very dry, your heart becomes very dry, you become critical, and you can become even an impersonalist. Sky. Rasa is needed. Um, but the combination of the, of the two, you know, how can rasa, how can you digest rasa if you don't have this basic siddhanta? This is what Shri Krishna Das Kaviraj was be saying. Don't be lazy about learning siddhanta. Siddhanta for the year. So this is the idea. So the last, last uh, thing um, um, on this first. Only the first part of the first chapter 
is uh, still linked with the prana, uh, the idea of prana, but with the idea of indra. Um, Prakardana comes to Indra. He has been working for Indra. Indra say, "I give you a boon," and he answers, "I want you to give me the boon." What is the? What you think is the um, most in, important thing in the Koti, ko, Koshitaki Brahmana? Huh? It's Upanishad. This, this is where it happens. Prakardana, and then Indra is saying, "You meditate on me." He's giving that. Indra is telling to Pratardana. It's not in your paper. Oh, because here it says gradual instruction to Narada, then to yeah. Atma's instruction given to Indra. And he wrote, Are you skipping this page? Uh, no, I'm skipping this story of the uh, instruction given to Indra and Virocha. Uh, it's because it's mainly about Atma. What is your Atma? You know, they look. Uh, he heard the story from Gurudev. He he told told it a few times. He, they, they they go and live as uh, Brahmachari uh, in front of, of, of Prashapati Brahma. They want to know what is Atma. And uh, after 32 years, he says, uh, go look uh, in a mirror or in the bowl of water. Dress yourself fancily, nicely, and look at yourself. What do you see? So they both say we saw ourselves very beautiful and everything. They say this is your Atma. So they both go home very happy. And Brahma is lamenting. He said they haven't had the patience of staying a little longer to know a little further. So Virocha, the king of the demon, he's very happy and he's telling all the demons, your body is the soul. I got this from Brahma. He told us, he told me that the body is the soul. So they're all happy to give all the... Uh, facility to the body. But Indra, he became a little doubtful, then he goes back to uh, Brahma and he says, well, the body is bound to become old and it's bound to decay and it's bound to be crippled It's something hit the body and you can lose your eyesight and so on and so forth. So something must be there that is beyond the body. So Brahma said, yes, it is true. Say another 30 years with me for celibacy and I will teach you about Brahma. So he stays another 32 years and then he tells him uh, whatever you dream when you see, whatever you see in your dream, that is your Atma. So he goes home and tenting halfway through home, then he says, well, the dreams are ever-changing. Sometimes you have a good dream, sometimes you have a bad dream. Then the dream body cannot be the Atma. So he goes back, then he receives another instruction after 32 years of celibacy. Uh, that it is deep sleep and deep sleep same thing is not satisfying until it gets the final answer which is uh, the Atma which is within you the, in the deep recesses of your, in your heart because Atma has a different meaning in Sanskrit it can mean the body, it can mean the mind, it can mean the, the inner soul and it can even mean the super soul so uh, this is more the description of the individual Atma than Brahma but it's just to show the gradation also how people can misinterpret Christian, Muslim, Jews, they think that the soul is the body and the mind. That's what they think. That you're going to resurrect with the same body and the same mind. So they are attached to the body and gross materialist also. Then you have uh, those who think that it is the mind made of dream or deep sleep and so on and so forth. So this instruction is different. And this instruction where Indra is telling one of the God, meditate on me as prana. He says, uh, pranosmi pragyatma tam mam ayur amritam upasava. I am prana, the intelligent atma. Pragyatma that was talking about. Meditate on me as the prana, the nectar of life. So the uh, question that is being asked is what is this uh, instruction? Is Indra telling him to meditate on him as Indra, as a celestial deity? Or is he saying the whatever Brahman is within me? So all the commentators, they're saying that this prana that he's describing is part of this prana as Brahman. 
and Ramanuja Acharya and others indicate that it is the Purusha Antaryami inside that is actually the, the what you have to meditate. Meditate on me, Indra as Prana, meaning meditate on what is inside me. So there's an example given in the Vedanta Sutra about Bhamanadev. It's not the incarnation Bhamanadev, it's a sage that he start also uh, saying is the Sutra 32, 30. Um, Dev. Mm. In the Brihadaranya Kaupanishad it is said, uh, seeing this, the stage Bhamadev, Bhamadev constantly repeated, I have become the moon and the sun. He identified himself as the moon and the sun to indicate that Brahman is the cause of his function as well as the function of the moon and the sun. Pranat Maharaj in the Vishnu Purana also. In the Vishnu Purana, the description of Pranat Maharaj meditation is that he is doing Aham Vrahopasana. He meditates on himself as being the Supreme Lord. This is described by, by Jiva Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Uh, in his uh, in his Bhakti Sandarva. Uh, so it is just to give it a hint that there is something within us that we can meditate on. So this is the uh, conclusion, say, of the first part uh, of the first chapter. I want uh, before the end of this seminar, the General Academy, to finish the first chapter. I will go quickly because. Uh, what is the rest is talking about different characteristics, positive and negative, about Brahma. Uh, we saw how we can understand Brahma through scripture, through a gradual examination, and how uh, he can be hinted at by some symbolic representation, like Akasha, Brahma, Jyoti. And uh, what is coming further is to describe what I called negative Negative theology, this is a comparison that I'm making. In some uh, theology, uh, we say that God has no attributes. He cannot be described. So he, he can only be described with negative words. He's not miserable, he's, he doesn't die, he doesn't sleep, he, he, uh, uh, he's unknowable. He, uh, he, so only negative aspects, so this is uh, one way, like uh, Yagi Valkya was saying, neti, neti, not this, not that. By the way, uh, the Vaishnava have a different way of understanding neti, neti. They say he's not material. This is not material. This is actually the, but this is a positive side. And he has positive attributes, like being infinite, like being the uh, Purusha. Uh, the great Purusha in a, in, a, in a cosmic world and the Antaryamin, meaning inside the heart of everyone. He's the size of a thumb, He's the size of a thumb living in the heart. You, it, this is uh, described in Vedanta, first chapter, the rest of the first chapter, to make us understand how we can meditate on Brahma, that he has a personal form, that uh, he is not devoid of attributes. This is the meaning of all the Vaishnavas they try to describe that Brahman has attributes and when he has attributes he is called Bhagavan. Is this all this understandable? Well, you have a page where you have a few of those attributes. Yes. They're positive and negative. Next time. Theology. So I call it theology. There's a difference between philosophy and theology. Um, Philosophy doesn't deal with the idea of God, doesn't care so much. Or else it calls it metaphysics, what is beyond, what is observable. Theology trying to describe a God and how everything works with this God, how he can have attributes, even though he's beyond attributes. So we'll see you next time. And, uh, but this is pretty straightforward, it's not really difficult. It's just to give a general idea, like I said, if you ever want to read Vedanta Sutra, then you can have at least like a, yeah, some kind of structure, you know, like, like a, 
you can apply and say, okay, this, this is what it means. And, and I don't need to, to understand every single line. Otherwise, you have a bunch of proposals and a bunch of Upanishad quoted and you don't understand why he's speaking about this, why, why is the uh, Vyasadev putting this in his book, why, why is it so important? Because this is not given. And, and um, this is my uh, attempt to, to present in, in a way that can be, uh, even though it can never be too simple, because if it is too simple, then it is not Vedanta Sutra anymore. You can easily say God is a creator, you can understand him through scriptures, and he's described negatively and positively, yes. But you can do it once you have understood everything else, yes. What is the version of this? Uh, this is the Brahma Sutra, Vedanta Sutra, of Bharadevi Devushana, translated by Banu Swami. And this is also translated by Banu Swami. This is the uh, Bhagavad Sandarbha. So you don't really have a Govinda Bhasha? It's Brahma Sutra and the other. This is Govinda Bhasha. Okay, you said Brahma Sutra. Yes, the title is Brahma Sutra with the Govinda Bhasha. Brahma Sutra is Vedanta Sutra. Govinda Bhasha, Bhasha means a commentary made by Bhadavi Dibhushana, uh, inspired by Govinda, Sri Govinda of Jayapur. So it's a full commentary on the yes. Sutra by Govinda Bhasha? By Bhadavi Dibhushana. This is the latest. There was no other commentary that has been made after this uh, commentary. Now I don't know if Gurudev has given a new commentary or has just given the different commentaries of the uh, um, previous Acharya. We'll know when it's translated into English. It's in Hindi now, it should be Hindi and good. Yes. Sure, someone can, but you know, when, I don't know what's, what's and then you said this was the first part of chapter 1, yes. which is here written the nature of Brahman. So I put those uh, indications, not the don't naturally follow like this, but it's, it's describing the nature of Brahman, yes. And then the characteristic also in the second part. Yes. I call that characteristic. It is an interpretation, just like symbols. It's not being used in Vedanta Sutra, but I'm trying to convey some meaning that can be helpful for the understanding. Otherwise, uh, just reading the Sutra will not do much. Like, why is he speaking about the sky? Why is he speaking about this? Why is he speaking about that? Some some explanation has to be made. Uh, another question. So, this is like a symbol, right? Like you can so use it as a symbol, yes. I understood that the Brahma Jyoti also gives light to the whole yes. Vaikuntha. So literally it also gives light. It's yes, like but it's also literally prana. But the, the light that we see is not, this is what I mean. This light is the visible light, but beyond this light is the invisible light where it comes from. That is the idea, much brighter. Everything shines because it shines. That's what it says in many Upanishads. The, the brightness of the sun and the moon and the fire, electricity comes only from that bright substance which is not totally visible to us. Because sometimes we're in darkness, we don't see any light. But the light is still there. So, Brahman is full of light, but that light cannot be seen with our eyes. It is beyond the light. Same thing with the backer. Yeah. But we say that it is better than the use of symbol. We say that it is a kind of manifestation. Yeah. In, in it, like the sun is like manifestation of Brahman. I don't know, partial. But because because we, we think that the word symbol is a negative uh, thing, it's not necessarily negative. The symbol is just a sign that indicates something that is hidden, that's all. The only negative context symbol is that we don't like the, the, the murtis being referred to as idols yes, or symbols. Of course, of course. So that's the only yes. context in which symbol... But this is what I mean, I, I didn't call them. 
I didn't call the Indra the symbol. I, I, I called um, natural elements like light, like breath, like uh, the sky, a symbol for Brahma. Even though there is a real sky, there is a real light, it exists. But those are like indication. Manifestation is like multi will be a manifestation, you know, manifest in this sense. But you can use another word if you like. I'm just trying to convey a meaning that it can be useful. You know, 